Hello, and welcome to the InforTech TV Live Builder Hour. My name is Paul Horn. I'm a product manager in the Platform Technology Group, and I have with me today Caitlin Porter, a senior engineer with the Platform Technology team as well. Uh, for those of you that are new to our sessions, I highly recommend that you check out the past episodes in the YouTube playlists. Uh, there's lots of great information in there. Um, and uh, obviously looking at attending future sessions for more live demonstrations as well. Um, there's a lot of great content that we're posting uh, uh, on a very, very regular basis. And uh, we're hoping to have lots of great sessions into the future. Uh, before we dive into the details, let me explain how these sessions work. The goal here is to create an interactive forum. Uh, we want you, our audience, engaging with us. Um, Caitlin today will be building and demonstrating the product real time uh, in a live demo. Uh, and uh, everybody can pray to the demo gods right now so that we, <laughs> we don't have any glitch. Uh, but um, we highly encourage you to participate in asking questions using the chat functionality of the client, uh, whether that's YouTube or LinkedIn, uh, to ask us questions and, you know, we can give you real-time answers um, that hopefully will answer questions that everybody has within the group. So, um, again, really encourage you to ask questions. It makes for a great interactive session. Now, before we proceed any further, it's important to note that this is a live session and therefore we need to throw up our disclaimer. Uh, during the course of this episode, we may cover various topics, including questions about the future of our product, roadmaps and proposed dates. However, it's crucial to understand that we're not making any promises or commitments in this episode for precise dates and information about functionality. You always want to make sure that you consult with your info resources, whether that's through support um, or your contacts and refer to the, uh, the official roadmaps for any new functionality that you're looking for within the product. Okay, so before we get to the build part of the uh, hour, um, I thought we'd start by introducing today's product, which is new, uh, and it's called OS App Designer. Uh, it's a new no-code application, or no-code application development framework uh, and it's built exclusively for the OS portal. So uh, this is a new thing for us. Uh, if you've heard of Mongoose, we do have a full feature set uh, application framework today, um, and it utilizes no code, low code, and full code. Um, but it depends on a, a lot of services and servers, um, whereas App Designer is built to be a very low footprint, cloud-only, cloud-safe development uh, framework for multi-tenant. Uh, and exclusively within the portal. So it has a really tight integration with the portal. Um, it actually uses the portal as its runtime. So whereas Mongoose, which is not going away, by the way, I'll just make sure that that's made apparent. Um, Mongoose relies on services for rendering uh, and doing a lot of complex uh, interactions. Uh, App Designer uses the portal as its runtime. Um, and it also utilizes a lot of the parts of the portal uh, in order to uh, render its pieces. So the IDS or design system uh, component tree, the libraries that are stored within the portal, we actually use as part of um, our application development framework um, and for the presentation model. Um, now, the question would be, what can you construct with uh, our brand new framework? Well, because we're brand new into this, we thought we'd start with limited functionality. And that really talks directly to widgets. Um, and utilizing widgets within the new portal with its uh, augmented framework for uh, workspaces and the new smart panel as well. Um, uh, it's just a really, really great place for us to introduce a brand new framework for building out small applications uh, that being widgets into those workspaces. Now, just to talk a little bit about workspaces, it's a really personalizable experience for you, the customer, in that you can select from a small group of functionality that's contained within our catalog that is specific to your ERP. And we post all of those. You know, those are the things that we create uh, internally um, and have created with the ERPs um, that you can then select from in order to build a personalized experience or a personalized uh, work stream for dealing with your application and your data. What 
we're giving you with the app designer is the ability to leverage that data as well to produce things that you want. Um, so not just the view of what Infor wants to see, but also the view of what you want to see. So you get to build your own, um, your own widgets, utilizing your data and representing that in a, uh, a really concise and usable manner in those workspaces. Um, and we do that, that access to the data is through our API gateway. So it's again, a very secure method of accessing the APIs. Uh, it's done using your uh, personal credentials. So when you develop a widget as an administrator, um, you might have access to data, uh, but then when you hand it to your users, they only have access to those things that they have API access for. Um, so again, very secure method, same method that your ERP uses to access that data. Um, and because we utilize the API gateway, any information that we surface as an API in the gateway um, can also be accessed. So whether that's external API information or information that might be in an offline state like the data lake. Uh, we have noticed that uh, in our experience with Mongoose, that sometimes we can um, overwhelm the production systems by hitting APIs all the time for information. Um, so it's sometimes better to go to the gateway or to go to the uh, data lake in order to get that offline information um, and access it near real time um, and then only access the ERP for those things that we need to do in a real time basis. Uh, so, uh, talking about widgets, um, we can utilize them to communicate with one another. Caitlin's going to be showing us an example of that today. Um, again, we can utilize them uh, for uh, accessing your localized data. And into the future, we're also looking at some other things like accessing the data uh, within your actual app real time that using a smart panel. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe at the end. And with that, I think that's a good enough introduction for me. So we'll pass it off to Caitlin. She can introduce herself and get us into today's build. Sure. Yeah. So my name, like he Paul said, is Caitlin Porter. Um, I've been working under him on the Mongoose enablement team for close to 10 years now. Um, so while I've exclusively worked with Infor Mongoose, a lot of my I've specifically worked a lot on how to extend your applications. Um, so now with Infor OS. I'm an early adopter of sorts, and I've been focusing primarily on really laying that groundwork on how to extend your different ERP applications with OAD. Um, so in today's demo, I'm going to start by showing you how to quickly build a widget using an existing data service. And then I'm going to, um, I'll dig it a little deeper in the second part. I will show you how to use some existing M3 data to um build out some widgets and I will implement some context messaging to show you how you can have widgets interact with one another. So that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and hop right into the demo. And I'll probably open it up again. Um, please ask questions along the way as Caitlin's going through the build. Um, and I'll interject whenever I can here to come in and uh, ask those questions, Caitlin, and we can cover that as uh, time goes on. Sure. Okay. So here is Portal version two. Um, this might look new to some of you guys. This is our newest version of Portal. So as you can see, App Designer is included in OS, like Paul said. Um, here you have a ribbon where you can access all of the different OS components. You can also access them from down here. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and hop right into App Designer by clicking on the ribbon here. And here is the launch page for App Designer. Um, you can see here, it takes me to the drafts. So this is a list of all of the drafts that I have, widget drafts, and it's uh, sectioned off into drafts, published versions. So published holds all of any widgets that you have published and or are deployed. Um, and then you have archived as well. Over here, there's a section for data services, which I'll touch on a little more later on in the demo. And then you also have a section for translations where you can define different uh, language translations here for different strings on your widgets. Um, so in this first part of the demo, I'm just going to quickly show you how to build out a, uh, a widget using an existing data service. So this data service that I'm using is an existing Mongoose data service. Later on, I'll show you how to do, uh, I'll actually show you how to build an M3 one. So starting off in the draft section here, I'm going to go ahead and click new page up here on the top. 
This will bring up a list of templates that are currently available. In this version that I'm running, um, I believe there are eight templates available that I can choose from. So we have some simple list widgets, which is what I'll use today. We have other types such as a forms widget, which will allow you to actually add like a button to perform actions such as updates, deletes, et cetera. Um, we've got a data grid widget, which is rows and columns of data. Then we've got a records widget, which is a um, table of data followed by fields on the right. We've got some KPIs such as counts, charts, and then we've got some informative type templates such as greetings and banners that can give that can display key messages to your uh, it, on your workspaces. So starting with this demo, we're just going to do a simple list widget. So I'm going to select this template here, and it's going to bring up the designer wizard. So here is the first step of the designer wizard. This will give you on the left you get uh, a bunch of different options to choose uh, choose from. So here you can choose. Um, you can set a title for your widget. In this example, I'm just going to call it customers. And you'll see as I type in real time, it populates, gives me a view of what my widget will look like. I can also use these um, on the left on the top to show what it'll look like if it was to be resized in a workspace. So all of these widgets are dynamic. They'll, they can stretch and they can, they're flexible. And so you can adjust all these different sizes within your workspace. So this gives you a view of what that would look like. So I give it a name. Um, in this example, I'm going to use, this is going to be a simple customer list. I want two labels. Maybe I want a hyperlink. So I'm going to go ahead and you can toggle something on and off. You can see here when I toggle it on and off, it shows on the designer over here. Um, you have other options. So in this example, I want to also show a logo for the different customers. So I'm going to go ahead and click show component. And here you can see it will show um, uh, where the image will be. You can also have initials. So if you wanted to just display um, an E and S for Eric Smith here, that would show as an initial here, just something a little more visually appealing to show. Um, I'm just gonna keep the image for this example. We also have other options available here, such as badges. If I turn this on, you can see this does a little pill shaped badge on the right. Here I can apply some conditional formatting as some like uh, indicators. So you can apply different colors to different numbers and you can define all that in the templates. Um, lastly, there's an icon. So I can do a status icon and this is also conditionally formatted. So you can format it to show different status indicators of your data. So for this example, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple. I'm gonna keep the image. I'm gonna do two labels and a hyperlink. So this hyperlink, I, I wanna drill into the Mongoose application. I wanna be able to click on it and to actually drill in to see more data about that customer. So we're gonna configure that in this example. So I'm good with this. I'm gonna go ahead and click next. And here's where I can give it a name. In this example, I'm just gonna call it um, customers. And I can give it a description here. This name is what I see, not what the end user sees. So this is just for me to manage on the back end. And then I can also apply tags here. So this is particularly useful when it comes terms to, uh, when you're dealing with really large sets of widgets. So this can help you categorize and group large sets of widgets. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit next. And here's where I have the option to select a data service. So. Data services are um, connections in the API gateway. So these are things that I've set up. They point directly to an API in the gateway. So here I already have an existing one that I want to use. And I'm going to select MET customers. OK, from here, I've got my selected data service. If I wanted to go ahead and test that data service, I have that option here to test it. And I could see what data is actually being retrieved from the uh, API gateway. So I can hit run here and you can see here it's returned back my data in the background. So I'm gonna hit okay and then hit next. Now I've got my data hooked up to it. Now I can actually bind the properties on my widget. So I've got these properties now that are empty. I can click on one of them. And here you'll notice there's also a list of elements here on the left. I can specify what I want to see. So here is my data service that I selected on the left. And below is a list of properties that are on that data service. So in this example, I'm going to select name. 
and I'm going to click my second label and I want to bind it to address. I'm going to click my hyperlink. I want to bind it to my customer number and then and the image. I have an image property. This is um, most image formats are accepted. I think this one is a base 64. So I have a logo and as you can see here, it gives me a great display of all of the logos uh, in my system. Now that I've got that done, I want to, uh, now I want to, I want to configure my hyperlink. So these utilize, so if I click on my hyperlink, now you'll see I have an option section over here on the left. I can use this configure element button to do so. So this will bring up a URL settings dialog. Here I have the option to select if it's a drill back, you can use a external source. Uh, in this example, I want to use a drill back to drill back into my application itself. So I'm going to click as drill back. You can use a static name if you wanted to say click here or something like that. I'm just going to use the customer number instead. So source field, this is what I am going to filter on. So this is my primary key for that table. And I want to filter on my custom. Um, I'm going to select my product. In this example, we're drilling into the Mongoose data service or into the Mongoose application. And I have a URL that I'm actually just gonna copy and paste into this value over here. So this URL, as you can see, this is this can also be accessed via the, in the Info Business Context Viewer, the drillback link in there that can drill into the ERP application itself. So that's what I'm using here. And as you can see, I have the source field that is populating with my custom. So with that being said, I'm going to save that. I'm good with that. And I can actually preview it by hitting this preview button up here and clicking into this. Nope, I might have to launch it first. Here we go. We can test that actually when I put it into a workspace. So here I've got that done. The, the hyperlink is configured and I'm going to go ahead and finish here. Once I finish creating it, then you will see it's going to go ahead and put it in draft mode in my um, draft section. Okay, it gives me a notification up here saying it was created and you can see it's right here. So here it's sitting in draft mode and now I want to be able to publish to a workspace. So I'm going to use this ellipsis up here in the top right. And we'll go ahead and click publish. It's going to go ahead and ask me if I want to publish and I'm going to click publish. Hey, Caitlin, while you're doing that, um, it's a few questions about um, Ion APIs and uh, that type of stuff. I know we're going to get into data services in a little bit. But um, essentially, anything that's available through Ion API is uh, available as a um, as a data service. So um, that would be any product that we have, right? Like, uh, for instance, as somebody had asked about Infor XA. Um, that's a little bit of an older uh, product in the family, but I believe it's also through uh, Ion API. So anything that's available as an API through Ion API would be. Uh, available as a uh, as a data service. Yep. Okay. So now that my widget is published, I can move over to this publish section on the left, and you'll see here now a version of that. So I've got this version here that is published, and you'll notice these other widgets over here have a green check mark to to them. That means that they've been published, and it says they've been deployed to the portal. So while my widget is published, it has not yet been deployed. So it's not actually accessible through the widget catalog. So in order to do so, I got to deploy it. So I'm going to go ahead and click the ellipsis and deploy. It'll ask me if I want to deploy it to the catalog and I'm going to say yes. And a question on how many versions can we keep um, of these? Uh, I don't believe there's a limit to how many versions. So. Quickly, if I want to touch on versioning, um, so say you want to, I'll actually demo that before I, so let's go back into drafts and let's say I want to make a change to my widget. I want a different version. I'm going to go back in, I'm going to edit my widget. 
and it's going to bring up the widget designer and say I want to change the um, let's change the I can go back in and change the page attributes up here I'm going to say I want to change this to customer listing and finish so now that it's saved I've got a different version of the draft if I go into here and try to publish it I'll get a different prompt this time. So you'll see here now, I get a prompt that says, what type of release is it? So because we already have an existing version of this widget, I have a couple different options. You can choose a major release, a minor, or a patch. If I choose major, it'll change the versioning number from 1.0 to 2.0. I can specify a minor release, which will change the versioning to 1.1, or I can do a patch, which will be change the last number 1.0.1. So I'm just going to say this is just a minor release and then hit publish. So now that it's published, let's go back into the publish section. And here you'll notice it says update available. That's because it's recognized that there's a newer version of this widget that is available. So I'm going to go into this settings over here and this will give me some information about the widget itself. But over here, it'll tell you the current version and it'll tell you the deployed version. Right now, they're both sitting at 1.0, but I want to change it to the latest version that I just created. So I'm going to go ahead and click that change version button. And here I get the option to pick any version. So this gives me the ability to move forward to a widget. And it also gives me the ability to move back if I needed to move back to a version. So these are all stored. There's, you could have, I don't know if there's a certain limit. Paul might know if there's a limit, but um, I haven't hit it if that's the case. Um, but you can store multiple different versions of a widget and you can go forward and backwards as you see fit. So yeah, I don't think there is a limit to that, but I'm sure. I, Somebody's I there. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't hit it yet. So that's good news. So I'm going to go ahead and change the version to 1.1 and hit save. And it'll update that in the, it'll say, do you want to deploy that new version? And I'll say yes. So now that my widget has been created, it's been published and it's been deployed, I can now access it from the widget catalog in a workspace to, to add to a workspace. So I'm gonna go up into the hamburger menu up here at the top left, and I have an existing workspace that I want to use, all right? There's nothing in here yet, it's just blank canvas. Here I'm gonna go ahead and click this add widget button. And if I go ahead and um, search in here, it is called customers. BH right here, and I can hit add. Once I hit add, it adds it in the background. I can resize it as I need it. You'll see here when I toggle on it, I can stretch it down. So say I want a big list like that, and I can save. So here, now I've got my widget, it's live. I can click on it. I can, if I, um, nope, that's not working. I must have configured, I must have configured the hyperlink wrong, but I have a working version of this I'll show you later. But now that my widget is live, I can actually access all that data. So that's the first part that just shows you how quickly you can build in, uh, you can build a widget uh, with existing data services. And let's say now that um, you want to create your own data service. So in this, this next demo, I want to show you how to create, uh, I'm gonna create two different data services. Both of them will be utilizing M3 data. Um, so these are M3 APIs that are available in the API gateway. I could go back into the gateway right now and test them. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and show you how to make a data service here. So these data services connect directly to those APIs. So I'm going to click the data service tab on the left. And I'm going to hit new data service up here. So there's three different types here. There's data lake objects that I can access. There's IN APIs, like we said. And then there's static lists where you just want to contain simple hard-coded type values into here. In this example, I'm going to use ION API and I'm going to click create. Here it's going to prompt you to find the API. So here I can access all of the different suites that are available in this tenant um, and methods. So these are get, post, uh, delete, all of the different API types. So in this example, I'm going to first start, there's an API called uh, list warehouses. If I hit enter, it'll pull up. There's two different M3 versions of this API. There's a 
version one and a version two. I'm gonna go ahead and select the version two and hit select here. Once I do so, it'll pull up any of the, um, any documentation from the Swagger and the API Gateway. So go ahead, I'm gonna give this a name and I'm gonna call it M3 um, Warehouses and uh, let's say test. I can give it a description, I can give it a tag and I'm gonna hit next. So from here, this gives me an option to um, provide any input. So everything you can see here is imported in from the Swagger documentation in the gateway. So I've got a HTTP method here is specified as get. So I wanna get a list of warehouses from M3. Here you can see the uh, URL with all of the different parameters. This is all coming in from the gateway. Uh, this request header is just a part of the JSON that is coming in. And the great thing about the M3 APIs is they work straight out of the box. There's no configuration that's needed. Um, for some APIs, you might have to configure a few things. You might have to input a certain values into here, but the M3 ones work straight out of the box. I can go scroll down. These are all the input values that came in and I can test this data service and I can run it down here and you can see it's retrieving a list of all of the data for the M3 warehouses. So this looks good. I'm good with this and I'm gonna go ahead and click next. Next hey, is where you can define. While you're, while you're just in the middle of that, um, uh, just to speak a little bit to the complexity of JSON, obviously, um, this whole section uh, from a data services perspective is really keyed at uh, people that, uh, like a business analyst, somebody like that, that's going to um, uh, have some knowledge of the APIs and the available schema and things like that, and also how to manipulate JSON. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just make a note that we are looking into the future to make a lot of these first class connections uh, that'll be to the ERPs. So whether it's M3 or CSD or um, you know any of the Mongoose applications, Sightline, Factory Track, uh, we're looking to build those so that um, we surface the componentry or the schema within there um, automatically. So whether it's going to, and we already have this for data lake. If you go to data lake, the data lake connection, it only shows you data lake objects um, and views that are already created. Um, similarly, for something like Mongoose, we would show you the IDOs and available properties on an IDO. Um, uh, and we're going to call those first class connections. They're still utilizing ion API and they're still in the background filling out this same sort of information, but the wizards will just be a little bit easier for maybe people that don't have as much knowledge about the available, um, APIs and be able to search that information as well. So just a small looking forward, uh, tidbit. Okay. So moving on. Um, we've got this output section. So we've defined our inputs here. And now there's an output section of things you want to actually output to your widget. So here you can see, I can actually view the JSON here if I really wanted to. So there's a root element that you can parse out the different values and these will output the different parameters. Here, I can also define an alias. So if you've got some um, cryptic type data that you want to be able to read, make it a little more readable, I can change that here. For example, I can change this to warehouse location. I can change this to warehouse name. And that will output the, um, the fields as warehouse location, warehouse name, which you'll see later on. So this one works out of the box. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I can test this one more time. So this will return back one record of data. If I click this test data service button and run, you can see it's retrieving. This is what the data would look like if you were to bind it to a widget. And here it's it's replacing those fields with my aliases here, which makes it a little more readable. So this all looks good, I'm happy with this. And I'm gonna go ahead and click next and it'll give me a summary of what I'm gonna create. And then I'll go ahead and click finish. Once I've done that, my first data service is done and I can now go in and create my second data service. So my second data service it's going to be a list of items by warehouse. So there is another API in the gateway that retrieves this type of data and it's filtered by warehouse location. So in this second one, I'm gonna select ION API again. And this time I'm going to search on 
it is list item. This is the name of the API. So list item warehouse by warehouse. You'll see in here the proxy path. I'm going to select the version two. And same thing, this time I'm gonna call it M3 Warehouse Items. And I can give it a description and tag if I wanted. I'm gonna go ahead and click Next. Hey, Caitlin, a uh, question on what you would use a static list for. So static lists, um, I've used them sometimes to hold URL, URL values. If I wanted like a, like a hard-coded URL value, I've used that before. Um, you might know some other scenarios, Paul. Yeah, I think we've envisioned that there might be, um, uh, if we were going to have like a validated list of information. Um, uh, App Designer does not have its own data store. These static lists are literally hard coded lists that would get posted with the, the widget itself. Um, so there's a chance that we might use that for validation or for a drop-down list or something of that sort. And again, we've used it, yes, for storing uh, information that we could then cross-reference. Um, so it's strictly a rows and column data table that you can store with your widget. Okay, so moving on. Um, in this second data service now, I I want, to re I want to feed it an input parameter. So like I said, in this example, we're going to feed it um, the warehouse location. So it'll filter by warehouse location. Um, so down here, I can retrieve all of them. However, I want to set a default value of 001 so I can show you. Let's go ahead and give this a warehouse location. And here, that will, I'm going to give it an alias and then um, I want to filter on, I want to see it filter on warehouse location of 001. So if I go down here and test it now, here I can also test, I can put in any value I want to test it, but I want to retrieve 001. And if I run this data service now, it'll only show me records that have a warehouse location of 001. So you'll see here, if I scroll down. Yeah, and an interesting question with this too. Um... For products like M3, you know, returns a thousand records, um, but I only want to show the first 50. How would I do that? Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's, there's several different ways this could probably be approached. We don't have, um, uh, we can make inputs. So where Caitlin was showing earlier, the JSON input, a lot of those APIs have um, an input value for the number of records to show. Uh, so it could be hard coded into the data service. Um, but eventually we would like to make that so that we can make that as an input value off of a configuration page that would be attached to the widget. Um, so again, future functionality, we're looking to make those types of variable uh, values available to the API. Um, but uh, today that would be something where you would then code it into the data service to only return back that, that number of rows. Um, and there might be other ways of doing that as well. But um, again, that's kind of where we stand today with that. Yeah, like Paul just said, here I would just put in a value of one. So that'll return a max record of one. And you can see here in the results, it's returned back one record. So that's how you would hard code it now into the data service itself. Okay, so I'm happy with my input parameters here. And I'm gonna go ahead and um, click next to move to my output parameters. Here, this all looks good to me. This is the root element that's been parsed by the JSON. And I just want to give a couple aliases. So I want to say item number and item description. So that all looks good to me. And um, I'm going to go ahead and click next and then click finish to create my second data service. So now my two data services have been created and I'm ready to make some widgets off of it. So I've got, I'm gonna move back over to the draft section here and I'm gonna click new page. So in this example, I'm just gonna do a real simple straightforward list widget and I'm gonna select that template. I'm gonna give this a title of warehouses. And I'm just going to keep these two labels and call it a day. So I'm going to hit next. I'm going to get its name and three warehouses. And hit next. 
So here's where I'm going to select my first data service that I created, M3 um, Warehouses Test. And I'm going to click this Add button to add it here. I could test it here if I wanted to, but I know this is working, so I'm not too worried about it. And then I'm going to go ahead and hit Next. So over here, I'm going to go ahead and bind it. I want to bind it here to, let's see, Warehouse Location. And I'm going to select Label 2, and I'm going to bind it to Warehouse Name. So now I've got a list of warehouses. And in this example, I'm going to show you how to have two inter widgets interact with one another. So in order to do that, we can utilize context messaging within um, these workspaces. So if I go back up to my list element here, now you notice I have this option of context message. I can um, go ahead and expand that and I'm going to send a message. So this is my first widget that I want to send the warehouse location number to my second widget. So it'll filter by that. So in order to do that, I'm going to click this sending button. Here you can specify a message name. Um, I can give it warehouse name as the message name. Um, this field can be unique to your workspace, it's case sensitive. Um, and here you can specify, it could be whatever you want. Uh, so I'll just use warehouse name in this example. In the source field, I'm gonna specify what I wanna send. So I wanna send the warehouse location value to that second widget. So I'm gonna select that, that's coming in from my data service. And I'm gonna go ahead and click save. So can I actually- have more, a uh, question, can you have more than one message name? You can only send one message right. as of right now. And, However, and can widgets, can there be more than one message name on a page, I guess is sort of the- Yes, yeah, yeah. you can send as many, you can have each widget sending a different message name. Um, and you can have widgets that send and receive at the same time. And you can have widgets, as many widgets as you want, interacting with that one message. So, nice. but you can only send one and you can only receive one at a time. So we've got our message sending. I've got this one complete. I actually already have a version of this created. So I'm not even, I'm just going to go ahead and click cancel because I have a version that just as in order to save time, I'm just going to hit exit. Now in the second widget, I am going to do the same thing. I'm going to create a simple list widget. And this is our widget we want to set up to receive that context message. So this is going to be called um, warehouse items. And same thing, I'm going to keep it real simple and hit next. Give it a name and three warehouses. Warehouse items and hit next. Right. And then I'm going to select my second data service that I created. So M3 warehouse items test and hit next. So now I've got my um, second widget and here I want to see an item number and I want to see an item description. So I'm going to bind item number to my first label and then my second label, I'm going to bind it to item description. So now I've got a list of items and descriptions, and now I want to feed in that context message. So I'm going to go up to the list and under context message, this time I'm going to say receiving. I want to receive that same message name. So we called it warehouse name, the same message name, and I want to specify what source field. And so we're using that warehouse location field here. Um, and I want to specify that same name that's being sent. I would save that message here and click finish to create my widget. So essentially the names have to match in order then, to yes. have one send and one receive and be listening. So it's sort of Correct. a talking listening kind of thing. Correct. So now if you wanted to see this in action, I have a, um, a workspace that actually already has these two widgets on here. So I've got a list of my warehouses right here. This is what we just created. And then I've got a list of warehouse items. You can see here as I click through the different warehouses, this other widget is automatically updating as I, as I uh, switch through each record. So this is, that, this is that one that's sending and this is the one that's receiving. So if I say I wanted to see, uh, I wanna see what message is being sent. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, edit something and I'm gonna show you something. So I can actually add um, the context viewer. So there's a, a standard widget called the context viewer. 
that I can add and save. And so here you can see the Infor Business context message, but here you can also see any of those context messages that are being sent from here. So if I go ahead and type in warehouse name, which is that message we defined, you can see it's actually spitting out the value of each different warehouse. As I change records, you can see the different um, values that are being sent in that context view. So this is the one that's sending, and this is this widget is listening for that message. So you can have multiple widgets that are listening to this message. And, and we didn't have to do anything in order to, uh, other than what we did inside of I or OAD itself. We didn't have to do anything on the page. You just basically selected these from the catalog. Correct. Yeah. So with that, you know, this is a really simple example and I can get is, so I've got an existing workspace that, um, I don't want to say this. You can have, for example, this is another, this is an example of a workspace using, these are all widgets that were built with OAD. Um, in this example, I've got all of these widgets are listening to different messages. As I change records, you can see all of the values on these widgets are changing. I can even go over here and change an order line. And you can see here that these order lines will change. I can see a detail off of base, based off of an order. Even if I select here, it'll show me different item. Uh, it'll show me details about that order line. Um, and so that's just how complex these context messages get. You can have whole dashboards of information that are all interacting with each other. Nice. And, and then in here, you'll notice I have this one widget over here. So this is a um, one widget that does an update. So um, here I have the ability actually with certain APIs to update data. So um, if I went into here and say I wanted to update, I want to bump up this to 55. Ooh, can, we see, can we see that through the drill back first? Through, see it through. Um, drill, back, drill back into the customer. Sure, yeah. Oh, I didn't even get to demo the customer. So if I go in here, I can actually show you the, the drill back links. So if I click on that, what this will do, this will pop you straight into Mongoose, filtered by that customer number. And so this then, is the source of the data that we're yes. seeing. Yes. And you can see here, this AR credit is set to 45,000. Um, I can update it from directly from my, if I go back to my workspace up here in the tab, Say I want to bump it up to 55 and hit update. I can go ahead, drill back into here, and it's automatically been updated to 55. Here, I can pop this open, and you can see here, um, I can also add this widget to my um, to the pop-out over here, and I can update it here as well if I wanted to. Right. If I hit update and then refresh over here, just like that, that data has been refreshed. I think it's probably worth mentioning that um, for those on the uh, uh, on the uh, show that are recognizing that you know is this connected? Um, this is actually future functionality that we're looking to have. We do not currently have in for business context messaging working. Um, that is something that we're working on for hopefully our we're looking for, at it as an October deliverable um, where we can uh, capture the in for business context message for in this case it would be communicating the customer number similar to what caitlin did with the uh the m3 selecting a warehouse this would be um capturing the customer number on the erp application through in for business context messaging to that uh widget on the in the smart panel um, and it would then uh, capture that customer number inserted here and then, of course, display the associated credit limit. So um, really the power of these widgets, once we have that functionality in interacting with your main frame uh, uh, application sitting on the frame on the, on the left hand side, that's really where the power is going to come in that, that context is, is really, really important. Um, we can do a lot of powerful things with that information once we can um, uh, 
you know, have that for, in this case, changing a value, but it could also be augmenting data where we're storing data back into potentially a, a Mongoose database or even the data lake is a potential as well. Um, there's a lot of future capability that we can surface once we have that, uh, that functionality. Yeah, and so we have a little bit more time and I'm gonna quickly show you guys how these update work, how, how the update works in App Designer. So if I go back into App Designer, I've got my widget. I want to show you how that um, how that interacts, that update is actually done. So that widget is called MET Customers AR. And I can go in here and if I go in and edit. So this is just another template that I selected. Um, and this template actually has a button on it that can allow you to configure it. So what this widget is doing is actually has, so if I go up to here to the page uh, change data service, you can see here on this widget, there's actually two data services that are hooked up to it. So we've got one that does an initial load. And what that load does is it has an input value of that customer number. That customer number will retrieve um, the data associated with it and will feed it out onto the widget. Then I've got an, actually I have an, uh, customer's update, which is a put API that will actually feed um, values into that put API. So I've got these two data services that are hooked up to the widget. This custom is fed in via um, context messaging from another widget. And I've got this field. This is a selected value of uh, the customer number, whatever um, filtered by customer number. And if I go to the button, I'll actually, I'm going to hop over real quick and um, so I've got the button and now I have the option over here to configure this button. If I go and configure it in the MET customers update, which I will show you guys in just a second, this is that update API. So this is a put API, uh, under the mongoose endpoint on the, under the mongoose endpoint. And there's three input parameters that this data service requires and it's custom AR credit sales year to date. So here I've got my custom, which I'm feeding in that value. I've got my AR credit. I'm saying, I want you to use text box one at, to provide that value for the AR credit. And then I want you to use text box two to update the sales year to day if you needed, if you needed to update that. So you feed in these input parameters here. If I go into the data service itself, I'm going to go show you the update of the data service. So the load is, um, let me go over here. So MET customers AR load is the first one. This retrieves back that filtered value. And if I go under here, here's that input parameter. It's saying feed in the custom. I have a default of 1065, but this is what that context message is feeding. And, and then it's outputting those three values that I want in my widget. So that's the first one that's loading the values. And then I've got my second one, which is MET um, customers, is it update, I believe? Yes, so this one here, this is an API called update item um, in the gateway. And here we have a little additional JSON that's needed for the request header. Um, here you can see it's a put method and I can actually view the JSON. If I click on this, this is actually a template that's imported from the Swagger doc documentation on the gateway. So it gives you a template of how to uh, update it. Here, the action value of two means update. You could do a one for, um, I think one is for new, uh, but that's all located on the API gateway if you needed to look at it. Here, I've got the different property values that I want to update. So I've got my custom, which I'm not modifying. And then I've got my AR credit, which is the one that I'm modifying. I'm saying down here, this is modified. Then I am, these are the input parameters that I showed you in the widget that I want to feed in. And I'm feeding in these values in the widget itself. So on that button, it's populating these values. And then when this API or when this data service is triggered, it's actually going to call that API and populate it with the values you're feeding in from, from that widget. So that's how those widgets, and there's no output parameters defined. It's all just input parameters on the, um, 
uh, on this data service. And if you wanted to take a look at that, if I hop over to the API gateway and search on the Mongo suite, here I can um, locate that API and all of this documentation is what's imported in on the data service. And I'm gonna scroll down to JSON and I have, this is the one that I'm calling this JSON put update item. If I click on here, you could test it out here as well. You could feed it all of, so here's that example value that the API needs. And this was automatically imported into the data service. If I go over to the model, it'll show me what it's looking for. Use one for insert, two for update, four for delete, et cetera. And that just gives you an idea of what that would look like in the data service. So you can use this kind of to um, uh, test things and uh, kind of assist when it comes time to um, building out your data services. Nice. And one more last thing real briefly. So this is, like I said, this is a, uh, this is a workspace that I built out using all of the templates uh, within OAD. And yeah, can you walk us through some of the different ones, all the, the different sure. templates that are here? That... Yeah, so we've got the list one that we, we've done. This is that grid, that grid template. This is the, uh, what is this one called? I don't remember the name of this one, Forms, oh, Forms update. widget. Yeah. Um, we've got the um, this one here with the grid on the left and the details on the right. We've got the charts. There's different charts that you could do. There's pies, there's donuts, there's bar charts, as you see, like a bar charts up here. Um, here is a header widget where you can display a custom uh, logo, a custom that's message. Great for and then, branding and stuff like that. And also describing a page. I think that's pretty neat. Yep. And this one over here, this uses your... Uh, your image from your actually from your your uh, portal settings, your user portal settings. This imports in your image, your name. Um, you can have whatever message you want to display here. That's the greeting widget. Then we you can also build up other. I have another dashboard that I can show you. Um, we have like this example HR dashboard where um, here's the different departments. These are all used context messaging. You can see here. Um, as I switch to the different departments, everything else on the form. So this is um, more charts over here. You can have different um, KPIs down here, this count widget that can display key data. Um, this little pill badge over here, you can use that conditional formatting to format a certain way, certain colors. And nice way yeah. to visually see uh, um, information and, and things that need to be addressed. Yeah. Well, very cool. And with that, I mean, that's about all I've got for my demo today. Um, we can open it up for questions now, discussions, things like that. Sure. Um, there is one question here. Uh, does the option exist for M3 on premise? Um, yeah. So uh, this is not available for on premise directly. So uh, the new OS portal is cloud only. Um, and uh, App Designer is a cloud-only framework. Uh, there probably is a bit of uh, cut over there if you're talking about uh, hybrid scenarios or something like that. But um, uh, no, this is only available in the cloud. So uh, jump to cloud. I uh, don't see any other specific questions coming in right now, but we are kind of getting to the top of the hour. Um, I guess I'll bring up that uh, to learn more about App Designer. Uh, we do have a resource guide that we're making available, um, and you can click on the QR code here uh, if you want to get access to that. Um, it gets you into all of our YouTube videos. Uh, Caitlin is the voice of uh, OAD. So she, there's all kinds of great videos out there that she's hosted. Um, there's KB articles, there's course information, and there's other resources as well, including recipes for all those data services um, that uh, you might be interested in if you're an M3 customer, or CSD, or Sightline. Um, those are all out there as well. So a great wealth of knowledge in that one little document uh, that you might want to check out. And with that, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I think we will call it a day, Caitlin. Yep. Thank you guys for joining. We really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. You guys take care.